So let's recap the last few chapters. In the beginning of chapter 26, in the beginning of Perich Havav, the Alter Rebbe lays down the principle that Simcha is crucial, indispensable in our service of Hashem. If you want to serve Hashem, if you want to have the energy necessary, the fuel to be able to um, win the constant struggle of life against the Nafsha Bahamas, against the Yitzhahara, we need to be excited, we need to be happy, we need to be light, we need to be, uh, I, I, I don't mean physically light, but I mean just uh, motivated. motivated, enthusiastic, excited, happy. The problem is, you <laughs> left him out. Gila, Rina, Ditsa, right? Everything can have to That's correct. Now, the problem is that too often we're weighed down by negative emotional baggage, which doesn't allow us to be Besimcha. So before we can talk about being besimcha, we have to first get rid of all those things that <coughs> impede our ability to be besimcha. If the car is stuck and you want to pull it out, you're going to have a very time, hard time pulling it out, even if you attach it to a tow truck, if there's another tow truck, hook to the other side, pulling it <laughs> in the other direction. So if we're being pulled in a negative emotional direction, it's impossible to pull yourself into a positive emotional space. And there are multiple reasons, there are multiple uh, types of, uh, of, of negative emotional energy. And there are many different um, causes of it. And we went through them one by one. So in Peri Chava, we spoke about the first uh, thing that uh, stops us from being Besimcha. The first thing that pulls us into a negative place is issues of Bane, Chai, Mezayna, material issues health, money, children, etc. So the Alter Rebbe, we talked about that, those of you remember, Alma Deskasya, Alma Desgalya, and ultimately the idea of Gamuzu Latoiva. We have to internalize the idea that everything that happens from Hashem is good. Sometimes it's good that we recognize as good, sometimes it's good that we don't recognize as good, and the good that we don't recognize as good is even greater good. So that gives us the ability to get rid of that emotional, the outrage and the feeling of injustice and the sadness that's associated with, um, with material, material issues. Then in, in the end of Perik Chavav, the Alter Rebbe moves to feelings of guilt. Very often that we're bogged down and what prevents us from being happy is feelings of guilt. The Alter Rebbe told us how to manage that. He said that the feeling of guilt might be justified, might not, in other words, depending on when the thoughts enter your mind. But either way, he told us it has to be controlled in a controlled time, in a controlled environment. And um, you have to experience that, those feelings and then you have to move past them and become besimcha. And then in chapter 27, the Alter Rebbe dealt with if you're unhappy, not with what you did, but you're unhappy with who you are, all the struggles and your character flaws. So how do we deal with that? So the Alter Rebbe says that we have to start uh, reframing our struggles and reframing our character flaws and understanding they're all gifts from Hashem, they're all mitzvah opportunities. They're all part of our mission in this world and every time we struggle, it's not a nuisance, it's not, uh, it's not pointless, but to the contrary, we're accomplishing incredible things and giving Hashem incredible nacha. So that was chapter 27. Then we moved on to chapter 28, which talked about the idea of Sometimes we feel like we're hypocrites, and sometimes our davening is, uh, leaves, leaves us uh, unsatisfied. Not that, but they're also reframed that and said, that's fine. That's just the nature of the battle with the Nafsha Bahamas, and you have to realize it's, um, you know, your davening is great, and your service of Hashem is great, and it's not uh, tainted in any which way by the fact that you have a Nafsha Bahamas that's fighting you. So, we went through all the different, um, different issues that might afflict a person. And we're not, we, we removed the, the tow truck which is pulling us in the negative direction. Now, we're, what's the word, tabula rasa? We're a blank slate. We're not, uh, we're not sad, we're not depressed, we're not dejected. 
But now we have to become happy. Now we have to become happy. How do we become happy? And we're talking here about a very specific happiness. We're talking about the ability to be excited about our struggle against the Yitzhahara. In other words, to be excited to do mitzvahs and to study Torah. Excited about our relationship with Hashem. And sometimes, oh, so, so how do we get there? So this is where Chabad kicks into, into, uh, into action. What is the idea of Chabad? Chabad means that we use our mind, our Chachma and Bina and Das, our wisdom and understanding and knowledge, and we uh, to generate feelings. I want to be excited, I want to be passionate, I want to be happy, I want to feel uh, suffused with love of Hashem and fear of Hashem, so let me, uh, I'll be what's called be misboinen, I'll meditate on whatever is necessary in order to be able to generate a particular emotion. If I'm not excited about uh, doing a, another Yid a favor, I'll, I'll meditate on Avas, uh, Avas Yisrael and the importance of it. I'm not excited about doing a mitzvah, I'll meditate on Avas Hashem. Or I'll meditate on the importance of the mitzvah. And right now, since I am not bogged down any longer by all those negative feelings, so if I use my mind, I should be able to produce positive feelings and feelings of excitement and passion, which will uh, propel my service of Hashem. Yeah. Tonight we're going to talk about how you convert the intellectual to the emotional. Because I think that holds up a lot of people, that they could read a whole Sefer Avas Hashem, but then to actually be besimcha, to express it itself, you know, they, they may be held up. No, we're not going to talk about that tonight, but okay. if you wish, you can go back and find um, the video of Peir Gimel. I'm assuming it's probably two different videos. Probably we did it in two shots. I'm talking about specifically the last part of Peir Gimel. We gave an entire class on Das. And the answer to your question will be over there. We spoke about it extensively, how to translate um, intellect into emotions. So today we're not going to talk about the how. We're just going to we're going to say it's already in the record how to do it. The problem is, Dr. Rebbe is going to say, is that sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes the Chabad is operating, but it's not translating into feelings. It's a darn neck. No. Sorry? It's that darn neck. It's that darn neck. Yeah. What does that mean, darn neck? The neck in between the mind and the heart is the neck. It's that narrow it's place. Narrow. Yeah. 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 And Kabbalah, it's actually Chukka. called. Chukka. Chukka. In the Kabbalah, it's called the Meitzar Hagarin, the straits of the, of the throat. Straits as in. S T R A I T S, straight, right? And this is called Timtum Halev. Timtum Halev means the heart is stopped up. Fashtopta, right? It's fashtopt. <laughs> the heart becomes like a stone, and no matter how much you try to work on impacting it in order to uh, engender feelings of happiness and excitement and love and whatever it may be, the heart just isn't responding. What do we do then? So again, our goal over here, if you remember actually, if you go back to Peir Chavav, if you turn for a second to page 64. If you look six lines from the top of the Peir Alter Rebbe says, page 64, six lines from the top of the Perik. E. F. Sherlinatsche, it's impossible to be victorious over the Yitzhahara. Ba'atzlu sukvedus, if you're lazy and heavy. And where do these come from? Where does laziness and heaviness come from? When I say uh, heaviness, we mean, we mean lethargy. Hanam shaches, they come from two places. Either me'atzvus, either a person is sad about something, and a, neg a negative emotional space, or timtum halev ke'evan. You're not in a bad place. You're not upset. You're not dejected. You're not anxious. But your heart is just not responsive. Your heart is stopped up. Ki'im, the only way to win the Yitzhah is with zrizus, with zrizus, alacrity, 
Hanam Shachis, which come from the opposite of those two, which is Simcha, and Psicha Salev, the opening of the heart. How you do that? Ah, so the last three chapters we talked about Atzvus. The problem is you can't win the Yitzhara because you're depressed, you're sad. So we got over the Atzvus, but then there's the other problem, which could be, which is you're not, you're not in a negative place, but you're also not in a positive place. Because your heart is just numb. Tim to my life. Yes. I mean, it seems like one very like direct way to handle all these things is to simply distinguish where things are coming from. Like, if you're depressed, distinguish. Oh, that's coming from the animal soul. Just consider. Well, that's the animal soul. It's that, and and then they just contemplate on the godly soul. And in all these matters you mentioned. They all, I'm presuming, they all emanate from the animal soul. All these negative things, these nothing things, these distracting things, they all come from the animal soul. If we just simply distinguish that, then we have two souls. So that's coming from the soul that's, so to speak, like getting in the way. Like the not, that, not the soul that you want to put your attention on. Just put your attention on the soul that you're supposed to put your attention on. And seemingly that's a direct way to... This is to live his path. One second, and that's the direct way to to arouse all the all the qualities that you want. Which is simcha, avos Hashem, yours Hashem, and it all emanates from the godly soul. I'm not sure what that means. What you're saying? Until now, we explained. Actually, if you want to know what we explained, is that you know, I think we've mentioned this in the past that <clears throat> the Tikkuni Zayar says. That the word besimcha is a permutation of the word machshava. Same letters. Same five letters in besimcha is in the words machshava. Which means that if you want to be besimcha, it's not about changing your circumstances, it's about changing the way you think about them, changing your perspective. That's what I'm saying. Right. And really, if you look in the last few um, chapters, that's what we were, we were changing our perspective. We weren't changing our circumstances, but changing our perspective. So when a person is suffering from uh, material issues, we change our perspective to a gamzula teva perspective. You know, struggles, we're not getting rid of the struggles. That's not the point. The point is to change our perspective the way we view them. And by changing our perspective, we can pull ourselves, we have the ability, we have the ability to pull ourselves out of the negative place we are. Because all all sadness is about perspective. It's all about perspective. Um, but, so how, how do you change your perspective to be besimcha? So, it would seem, just like you change your perspective about the, about the things that seemingly are bad, such as your guilt and such as your struggles, such as your, your spiritual struggles, your physical struggles, so change your perspective. Start thinking about Torah and Mitzvah and Hashem in a certain way. And that should bring about positive emotions. And by the way, it usually does. Let's be very clear. If you get rid of the negative, if you internalize Peirach, Chavav, Chavzayim, Chavchaz, chapter 26, 27, 28, and you worked on that, and you got rid of the negative. And then you work on changing your perspective and how lucky you are, and that you have a relationship with Hashem, and you how much you love Hashem, and uh, how wonderful Torah is in the mitzvahs. That should bring you to emotions, but it doesn't always work. There is a condition that appears sometimes called Timtum Alev, which means that regardless of how much you're trying to change your perspective, it's not working. Your heart remains closed. You're stuck in limbo. You are in this <coughs> neutral zone. In the neutral zone. So what's the cause of it? What's the cause of it? Because some people don't have that. That's a very good question. It's, it's because knowing the cause of it is probably key to getting rid of it, right? Yeah, cause and effect relationship. We'll, find, we'll definitely find out what the cause of it is. But before we find out what the cause of it is, I know usually you say cause and effect. First we're going to learn a little more about the effects and then we're going to go to the cause. That's what Dr. Ebbett chooses to go about it, okay? <laughs> Let's do this inside. Again, page 70, Perich of Tess. Ach, however, Eid Achas, there's one more thing, Sadach Loshes, Eitzes, Benafshi, Sabenini, that those who struggle, they have to sometimes take to heart. There's an issue that they can, they can be affected by. And that is, Asher Lepomim, that sometimes we eat in Merabim, and it can happen even frequently. Yesh Lam Timtum Halev. They suffer from a stopped up heart. The heart becomes like a stone. And 
And no matter how much effort you put into it, you can't open up your heart to davening. The sir, but he, he doesn't just say tefillah. Getting the heart involved in davening is very difficult. And sometimes also as a result of the state of Timtum Halev, a person cannot do battle with his Yetzir Hara, to abstain and sanctify himself in those areas that are permitted, because of the heaviness of the heart. So the Rebbe says here two things. There are two, you, you asked what the cause is, and I said we're going to talk about the effects. There are two effects over here. When a person has Tim Tumalei, the two areas that are going to suffer are davening. Not that the person won't daven, but um, the person can't open up the heart for davening. And also in the area of Kadesh Asma Mutterlach, which is the idea of being holy and abstaining, what we called two chapters ago, Iskafia, abstaining even in those areas that are permitted. What is unique about these two areas? Why, is, why are these two areas going to suffer? So perhaps the idea is as follows. When you're not in a passionate and motivated and excited state, what's going to suffer? Are you going to wake up in the morning and walk over to your local McDonald's and order a cheeseburger? No. Because you're not feeling in an excited mood? You're not going to do that. So what areas are going to suffer? The red lines are going to remain red lines. Those things that you're not allowed to do, those things which aren't really even a struggle for you anymore because they're, they're, they're concrete, they're, you know, uh, they're etched. I don't eat in McDonald's. You're not going to suffer. But there are those gray areas. Everyone has in life those gray areas. We're the most important thing about a gray area, the most defining feature of a gray area is there is no right and there is no wrong. It isn't measurable, it isn't quantifiable. When you wake up in the morning, you have to say good, you have to say good morning to your spouse. It's kind of like a rule, right? If you get up and you walk past your, your wife or your husband and just don't say anything, that's that's, that's wrong, right? That's not a good way to start a day. Most of us won't do that, hopefully. But how much energy do you have to put into that good morning? Is it good morning? Or is it, good morning, how was your night's sleep? And, uh, I don't know, whatever else uh, you want to add in over there. <laughs> so that, if you're going to wake up in a, in a, in a happy mood, you're going to do the good morning with all the, you know, with the, with the icing and the cherry on top. But if you're waking up and you're in a very unenthused and uninspired uh, mood, mood, so you say good morning. Right? But the good morning you say. Why? Because the good morning is quantifiable. You have to say good morning. It's not quanti the energy you put into it and afterwards the follow-ups, those aren't quantifiable. Those are the areas that are going to suffer. I mean, how you saying it, not what you say. Yeah, there, there's always, there's the intangibles. There's the intangibles. Um, and when it comes to your anniversary, so what are the rules of anniversary? What do you have to do on anniversary? Don't forget it. Don't, number one, don't forget it. Very good. Okay. Okay, and number two. Get something. You have to get a gift for your wife. There you go. Okay, number three. Then happy anniversary. Tell her happy anniversary. Okay, you know, number four, probably you have to get a card, right? Just getting a gift alone doesn't do it. Right, number five, you have to take her out for supper or something. Okay, a restaurant. Okay, so number five, maybe maybe flowers. I don't know. Whatever. Those are things you're going to do whether or not you're interested or you're in the mood. You wake up, you're at, right? But then there are the intangibles. What are you going to write in the card? How much, how, how much are you going to write in the card? How's the, uh, uh, you know... The, the intangibles are what is most impacted by your mood. The, in, the intangibles. In our service of Hashem, there's also intangibles. Two examples of intangibles are davening. How much kavana do you have during davening? Now, the fact that I have to say the words from here till here, that's, that's very quantifiable and tangible. And, um, but how much kavana do I have to have? How much effort do I have to put into the davening? 
It's not, it's, that's, that's unquantifiable, it's not intangible. That's something which if you're not in a good mood is immediately going to suffer. Understand? Not whether you're daven, not whether you're running to McDonald's, but the amount of energy you're going to invest in your davening, that's, that, that's something which your mood will directly impact. Why? Because anything which is unquantifiable suffers from your, your mood loss. There's a certain uh, baseline with the rules that we follow. The same thing is Kadesh Aschel Muterlach. Sanctify yourself that even in those areas that are permitted, but if it's not something which is necessary for serving of Hashem, don't do it. Is that quantifiable? So right now, I have this piece of chocolate in front of me, or I have this piece of chicken in front of me. Can I eat it or not? Yeah. Is the chicken kosher? Yeah. yeah. I do I want? Could eat it. I could eat it. But what does Kadesh Aschel Muterlach tell me? Show restraint. Show restraint. So should I eat it or not? <coughs> okay. so that's how, again, that's, that's unquantifiable. Meaning, it requires... What? Arbitrary. It, it, I wouldn't call it arbitrary. I, I, I understand it's what you're saying. To, to it, right. That's not right. right. It's, it, it varies from person to person. It varies from minute to minute, from hour to hour. Now I need it. But that requ- so to do it right, because, it's an, because again, it's an intangible, unquantifiable... To do it right, you need to be excited about it, right? And then you, you're, 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 you're motivated and you're inspired and you're really paying attention, doing it right. But if you're in a bad mood, you're like, oh, chicken? Yeah, sure, I need it to serve Hashem. <laughs> Chocolate? Yeah, I need this lift. I need this. But why? Because there is no rule. You can't have it. Whenever there is, the areas which are impacted the most is where there are no rules, is where you need to self regulate. And that's why, perhaps why, Dal Rebbe brings these two examples, because when we're talking here about a person who's suffering from timtum halev, from a lack of emotion, a stopped up heart, it would seem that the areas that suffer most are areas such as davening, such as kadosh has mutilah. Yeah, you'll do the right thing. Yes, you're going to go to shul, and you put on shul, and you're going to daven, you're going to eat kosher. Okay, you're going to do your daf, you're going to be whatever it may be. But you're going to lose your ability when your heart is, is feeling like a stone, the, it's the intangibles that suffer. You're davening, you'll daven, but it's not the same davening. When you'll kadash hasam mutalach, you're, you're gonna, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good, that's good, yeah, serving Hashem. That's, what, that's what's gonna suffer the most. Yes? And what, what do we see that the Baal Tanya mentions davening rather than learning? Is davening more of an example of this than learning? That's an interesting question. Um, I would think that when we're learning, the, um, <coughs> when we're learning, you're paying attention to what you're learning, right? I think the the uh, kavana, yeah, and I think that the no baseline by learning by davening. I think at least say the words by learning. Can't think of short cut. There's learning. no baseline. The, I think the fluctuation in kavana is much stronger in davening than it is in learning. I think we, if you still not to learn, you're going to learn more. You know. In davening, the, 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 the degrees to which you can really put yourself into that I think is a little larger. Which, I mean, your question still remains a question. But it's also possible that Dr. Rebbe is mentioning here davening because you realize that if you don't daven properly, the problem isn't only you didn't daven properly. Then you're in for a double whammy because number one, you're uninspired. And number two, you didn't daven properly. And if you don't daven properly, davening is... is what makes you a day? It give, it, it right, that day. adds even if you, you if you wake up inspired and you daven well, that you just makes added another three you know three times as much inspiration. So the fact that you didn't, and I don't know if learning has the same impact as davening. Over yeah, davening is a very strong. So if you can't daven, that has a stronger carryover. But but your question remains. I think learn, his answer learn, to him, learn, yeah, learning, you always learn something learning. new. Always not learning. Davening is always the same. But I, I, I think that what you're saying is is. A little commentary what I'm saying. You're saying, why is it that Kavana fluctuates more by davening than by learning? Because you know, you're repeating the same words. So it takes much more effort to be focused davening than learning. I think that's true. Yeah. Unless you're reading Chomish, there's no such thing as reading learning. Yeah, yeah, but there is. You know, you could, you could learn and you could learn. You could sit down with the Gemara and you can, uh, or you could sit down and, you know, there is. There is no question. What he's saying is correct. It is, it is an intangible element to learning also. As the, as the, but I think it's it's less than davening, I think. But there is that intangible also learning. There's, there's, no, there's intangible in every mitzvah. How you do it? 
You know, there's the here. You know, you can do a mitzvah like this. You can do it like that. But I think two areas where just that we are very much defined by intangibility. Defined. Not only they have intangibility, but they're defined by it as davening. Because you daven without kavani, you didn't do anything, right? And the idea of kadosh matzchol and mutar. Akapanim. Those are two examples that Rebbe gives. I gave you uh, perhaps one way of looking at it. Maybe the other ways of looking at it. But the bottom line, the problem is, we're feeling unenthusiastic. And again. I want to emphasize, the normal way of getting about this is, you wake up in the morning, you're uninspired, what should you do? Pull out a Sefer uh, Tanya, pull out a Sefer Chassidus, pull out a Sefer Musr, learn something inspiring, think about it, uh, you know, and, uh, take the five minutes, today I know thinking for five minutes is like, wow, five minutes to think? One second, so what's, 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 what does it say on my phone, you know? How can I think for five minutes without being distracted by some sort of, uh, <laughs> uh, what? That's the great thing about Shabbos, right? No, but our minds are so, no, today, they literally, the, like the marketing agent, they know that like, you have like 20 seconds to get someone and after that, they're gone. It's like, it, it's amazing what, uh, what, um, okay. what this has done to us, right? Um, but, okay, five, if it's too much to ask five minutes, sit three minutes, sit three minutes, think about the Hashem and the gift of life and how great Hashem is and Torah and Mitzvah, and that should inspire you. So that's the standard, and that will work most of the time. However, sometimes it's not going to work, and that's what we're going to address, which, again, we're, we're addressing in this period the exception, not the rule. The rule is, that if you're feeling uninspired, that's where Chabad kicks in. That's really where Chabad kicks in. But what if it doesn't work? That's what we're going to address. And... Word of warning, the next two chapters, Perich Avtes and Perich Lamed, is going to be a bitter pill. Bitter pill? Bitter pill. You know what a bitter pill is? You have ex your experience. It's a chocolate covered. <laughs> no, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. The inside is chocolate. Oh. <laughs> the inside. The outside is the, is the bitter. Now I have no, to have what you yeah, um, you can call the next two parakim is going to be the Musr and Tanya because it's going to be the Alter Rebbe is going to take a hammer, and it's going to be um, we're going to be dealing our egos a lot of blows over the next two chapters, as we shall see right now. Um, but the purpose of this all, the purpose is, you know, what is, so what, you have it in Musr also, but the difference is that over here the purpose is to lead to Simcha. We're going to be dealing with a lot of what they call hachna. We're going to be dealing with a lot of uh, what Dr. Rebbe will see what the Zoyer calls a lot of crushing, self-crushing. Crushing ourselves, crushing our ego, realizing how lowly we are. But the purpose is going to be not to lead to a place where you're, um, you're you know, uh, dejected and what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, frightened. Not frightened. You know, bekivutz. Uh, contracted. Right and small, but contrary, it's going to be a liberating experience ultimately, and it's going to lead us to intense simcha. But that's going to be a process, and it's going to take us a few months to get there. So that's just a, a warning in advance. So Dr. Rebbe is going to tell us that um, the Zoyar tells us something interesting. In Gan Eden, there's a yeshiva, and there are there the malachim and the nashamis. They sit and they learn, and like every good yeshiva, there has a rosh yeshiva. So uh, the Rashi Shiva of Gan Eden is quoted in the Zayar. And what is he quoted as saying? Let's, let, let's look at this inside. So what is the advice given? The Zayar there's two lines from the bottom of page 70. Yeah. So what is the, the advice given in the Zayar to someone who's suffering from Timtum Halei, from this state of a stopped apart? So the Tzad, what does it say in the Zayar? The Amar Rav Mesifta Began Eden. The Rashi Shiva in Gan Eden says, Aa, a piece of wood. Dilei Salik Bein It's not catching on fire. So what do you do if you have a piece of wood? You want to light it on fire? What do you do with it? You have to make friction. You have to make friction. What's another Eitz? Anyone made like a campfire when camp that way way back? What? It's more fire. You gotta make the wood <coughs> chop up. Chop it up. So this is like old fashioned because today. I know, I just made a fire last summer. You just take a can of uh, a lighter fluid, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and the whole thing lights up very quickly. But in the old times, before they had these kind of, uh, so what's the, it's a mivachinle. You have to take it and you have to take an axe 
and you have to splinter it into little pieces. You have to, um, what? Because a, a thick log, it's very hard for it to catch on fire. But if you cut it up into little pieces, into wood chips, then it's uh, a... Yeah, it goes on fire as a... Hulu. Gufam, a body, lay solid, being a hid in the What if you have a body, the body is like a log. And the air of the neshama is not catching, the body is not, is not, the fire of the neshama, the fiery passion, the love, the emotions of the neshama, the body is remaining impervious to them. What do you do? Mivachem le You have to crush the body. <coughs> This is a, remember those words, because we're going to be revisiting this again and again. If your body, which if this is describing Tim Tamalev, you have a goof. You say a goof, it doesn't mean the physical body. A goof, you know, the goof, the Nafsha Bahamas, the person. So the Nishama is on fire. By every single one of us, the Nishama is on fire. The Nishama is on fire with love of Hashem and love of the Torah and love of every other Yid. But what if uh, the goof is just not catching on? You, you know, the fire is on it. You have to crush the goof. What does it mean to crush the goof? First, let's talk about Pirush Nahira the Nishmasa. What is the light of the Nishama? What does it mean, the fire of the Nishama? Sha'ir Anashama Vasechel, the light of the Nishama, which is in the, uh, and the mind. In other words, the, the mind which is thinking the greatness of Hashem. Eni Meir Kalkach. It's not illuminating enough. Limshoil. To overpower and overcome al khumri yeshabaguf over the materialism of the body. The khumriyas. Khumriyas is a hard word to translate. The materiality. Materialism. Corporeality, maybe that's a better word. That's a more grub, uh, you know, the grub kite of the body. We're talking about a person who understands. And contemplates in his mind and the greatness of Hashem. If you didn't think about the greatness of Hashem and contemplate it, then you don't have Timtum Halev. That means you just didn't, uh, you didn't, didn't try, right? You, 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 of course, you're not gonna, your, your heart's not gonna catch on. You didn't try. But here we're talking about a person who did, who does understand the greatness of Hashem and has contemplated in his mind. It has not caught on, and it's not sticking in the mind to the point that it can dominate and control the grabkeit, the corporeality of the heart because of the grabkeit, the grabkeit of the mind, the grabkeit of the heart the reason he gasus aklipa, this is just a uh, the grabkeit. What's that other word for grabkeit? The coarseness of klipa. Shamagbiya atzmal er kedushas nefshalakis, which lifts itself up against the light and the holiness of the of the neshama. Umasteras and it hides it. Umachshicha oiray oira and darkens its light. Ulazayis and therefore, so what's the eitzah? Sarech levatsha. We have to crush it. And to denigrate it to the earth. And what does that mean? So by the way, there are many people, historically, who looked at the Zayar, and they said very literally, my body is not catching on the air of, uh, you know, of the neshama, my, uh, my body is remaining impervious to the light of the neshama. So what do I have to do? I have to crush my body. So what does that mean? I'm going to fast. And roll in the snow, right? There are various uh, sigufim. And the Altarab, that's not what the Altarab is saying. That might be a very, very sim simple, simplistic and simple interpretation of the Zayar. And I'm not going to say that it's wrong. The Altarab is saying that's not, that's not what's the point. the point. The point is a much higher point, which is it doesn't mean physically to crush the body, but spiritually to crush it. And therefore, it's not like we have to crush it, and denigrate it to the, to the earth, the Hainu, which means to establish times, to designate times. Sorry? 
to belittle oneself. To be repulsive in one's own eyes. Kakasov, as the Pasuk says, A broken heart and a broken spirit. And as we learned in Perich Avav, that the word ruach here doesn't mean a broken heart and a broken spirit of your own, but when you break your heart, you break the spirit, the ruach atumah, the spirit of klipa. Shahi hi ha'adam atzmei bebeinim. Because by the struggler, by me and you and everyone sitting around the table, the sitra achra is who I am. It is who you are. It's not part of me. Who are we? We are a sitar achra. We are klipa. Because we are the nafsha bahamas. You're not very comfortable with that. No, it's fine. We're born with it. It's kind of funny. No, you're born with it. You're born with both. But you're the author is talking about saying you're, you, you are the sitar achra. You yeah, are. Because it's part of you. The what? You keep on saying that the fault is the nafsha bahamas. The fault is the nafsha bahamas. You are the nafsha bahamas. You have a nafsha lakis. You got that? That's, that's you. That's me. That's you me. are. You are the nefesh abamis. You have a nefesh alikis, which is constantly sending you messages and trying to get you to do the right thing. But to a certain extent, it's not you. In fact, I'll tell you what points to in the morning. We say, Elikai neshama shenasata bi tahirahi. We say, Hashem, the neshama that you placed within me is pure. What is the implication of those words? The neshama you placed within me. Who is the me? The goof? The, the, I'm the goof? The body? The bo I'm not the body. person is not a body. When the neshama leaves the body, and there's only the body, they take the body and they bury it. You're not your body, you're your neshama. So what does it mean, neshama shenasata me? What does it mean, the neshama that was placed within you? You are the neshama. No, you're not. You're the nefshah Bahamas. I spoke to a Bukhar who, who said that, that they taught, he taught in, like, in the Bible Shiva that a person is the nefesh of Sikhs, which the Rebbe doesn't talk about anymore. No, and we're not going there. Okay. <laughs> See, not, <laughs> too much knowledge is dangerous. Yeah. Not you have to go to an advanced class or something. You're born with a nefesh of Yes, oh, precisely. Yeah. No. No, no, I did one. You have one. You are a nefesh Bahamas and you have a nefesh I don't follow that. What's the difference? What's the, what's the difference? I am you nefesh 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 and you have a nefesh alikis. That's a necessary to a nefesh alikis. A nefesh alikis. Why is it not the reverse? I mean, where I'll explain it. Okay. Necessary. Why is it not the reverse? That's a question for the Eberster. But what is it? You know, you want to know the why? The metaphysics. You want to know the yeah. physics? Uh, let's hear what. I don't stand it. There's a song, I think we've spoken about this already in the past. But after being here two and a half years, who knows what you said and what you didn't say. So you have to forgive me if I repeat myself once in a while. Maybe you do. Maybe you just pretend that you're uh, hearing everything for the first time. <laughs> which, in which case, I appreciate it. Um, there's a song that's sung. Uh, it's a Lubavitch song. Maybe some of you heard it. It's called Es and Ezich. Uh, there you go. I was waiting for someone to sing it. Es and Esich Shlaf and Shlavtzach. What's on the Tana? I said David Zichnisht. Es and Es and Esich Trink and Trink Zich. What's on the Tana? I said Learn Zichnisht. So for those of you who, for those of you who understand Yiddish well, you know what it means. For those of you who don't understand Yiddish well, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But for those of you who have a minimal understanding of Yiddish, you probably translated it wrong. Most people who, have, who don't understand Yiddish well don't understand what it means. They think, oh, we eat. And we drink and we sleep, but we don't daven and we don't learn. That's not what it means. What does es and ezzich mean for someone who understands Yiddish well? It's hard to translate the words es and ezzich. But es and ezzich means? Without, without, what? Without any trouble. Without I any eat without any trouble, exactly. Exactly. Eat easily. I sleep without any trouble. I eat right. It's natural. But the learning doesn't go anywhere. Doesn't but when I daven, when I learn, <laughs> yeah, I daven, yeah, I learn. But it's a totally different story. When I, if you don't, uh, if uh, when I when I when I need to eat, when I'm hungry, I don't sit down and say, "Okay, you know what? 
right now, for the sake of my health, I need this amount of grams and this amount of, 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 of carbs and some sugars and some carbs. Let me make myself some sort of mixture and just throw it into my body because I need to eat something. And when you need to sleep, you don't sit and think, oh, if I don't sleep, I'm the... So what do I have to, I have to go to sleep, right? No, no, no. When you're hungry and you see food, boom, <laughs> hand them out, right? <laughs> when you're tired and there's a bed, or even if there isn't a bed, right, you're sleeping. But when it comes to davening, when it comes to learning, you're like, oh, I have to daven, I have to learn. You, you're, you're forcing yourself to do it. It's something which you have to make yourself do. You don't make yourself eat. It's natural. And the song, which is, uh, it's, it's, it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a sad song, but it's a, it's not, 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 the word isn't born fully there, but as in, as, as, love, in, love, it's like, why? Contemplative. Contemplative, right? Why? <coughs> The needs of my neshama are, are no less basic to me than the needs of my goof. My need to daven, my need to learn, is no less than my need to eat and drink and sleep. So why is it that this, that es and ezach, when it comes to eating, no problem. no problem. And why do I have to struggle to daven? Why do I have to struggle to learn? Or to put it in different words, davening and learning are all learned behaviors that we have. And eating and drinking and sleeping aren't learned behaviors. They're natural behaviors. What does that tell you about who we are? It tells you that you are a nefesh abahanis and you have a nefesh alikis. One is native to you. The desires of the nefesh abahanis are natural and native to you. Your desires in nefesh alikis are imposed upon you. By your neshama. Might be hard to hear. We don't like hearing that we are the nefesh of Bahamas. It's much more pleasant to hear that we are the nefesh of the Gis. But that doesn't change the fact. That's, uh, that's who we are. Now you ask, why is it that way? That's what Hashem created? Or that's part of the divine plan? Well, that's a dep- it's a depressing thought, actually. Which, by the way, is what Dr. Rebbe is trying to accomplish. I guess that's the big fear of Hafshas. If it was there, if the... De- if the if we were the Nefesh kiss and the Nefesh Bahamas would come in sometimes, it, 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 there it wouldn't be much of a uh, Bechira. We would always do the right thing. I think I've mentioned this in the past, that um, in, in, in the Altar of Ma'amar, I'm in the Kuti Torah and Torah Er, so very often you have the question, that Rebbe raises, why does the neshama come down into this body? The neshama comes down from this high place, the high roof, and it falls amikta to this deep pit, to this disgusting and lowly and materialistic and corporeal and whatever other words you want to give it, world, where we're surrounded by uh, taivas. Why does why does this? So imagine like taking the the the, the son of a king, a prince. And throwing him into a chvase, into, in into a Harlem. into a, into 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 a landfill in Harlem, into into the dirt, into the schmutz. No, what's the answer, Alan? What's the answer? Well, I, I, I was suggesting that do, do, that you get schar for the bechira. There we go. So you have an answer. Very good. What? Whatever. All answers. The general the general answer is. Yerida Tzayra Chaliyah. Yes, it's a Yerida, but the purpose of the Yerida is that brings us to greater Aliyah. So we have an answer. We're all good, right? And then you open up the next Maimir, and what do you have? What have Lama Zayarda Hanasham Malatei Chaguf. And then you read a little further in the Maimir, what's the reason? There's Yerida Tzayra Chaliyah. And then you go to the next Maimir, and guess what the question is? Lama Zayarda Hanasham Malatei Chaguf. We just answered it. We know the answer. Even Alan knows the answer already. Why do we have to go through it again? So, Bachsidin, they say, because there are some questions that even after you have the answer, you're not happy. You just keep on asking the question. <laughs> so, I know the answer. I understand, you know, in a very cerebral way, I understand why Manasham had to come down. But it bothers me. If you were the king's son and you were thrown into a landfill and you asked, why am I here? And someone came and says, you know, there's a reason why you're here. This is the reason. Are you going to stop asking why you're here? Because you understand the reason? No. If you're completely, uh, 
What? Insensitive? Are used to it? Or? Yeah, well, but that's sad. That, that's when Yitake uh-huh. stop asking. But as long as you're not insensitive, as long as you remember what the power, you keep on asking. So I know why my neshama is down here, but it still bothers me. Why is my neshama down here? Right? The same thing with the song Esenezich. I believe the Rebbe once said, we keep, the song keeps on going because the question doesn't have an answer. You're going to give me an answer. The reason why, you're going to explain to me why. Said, said. It's nice, so I have an answer, but how can it not bother me? How can it not, not bother me the fact that davening and learning are unnatural to me? They'll never be, unless I'm at tzaddik, they're never as natural to me as eating, as eating and sleeping. Again, with that caveat being, unless I'm at tzaddik. The Atireb is actually going to bring down in this paragraph over here that by a tzaddik, it's the opposite way. The desires of the Nefesh Elikis are 100% natural. And the desires of Nefesh Bahamis are not. See, the Gemara says that Hilo Hazakin that when he left the base Madrash from learning, so he told me the master, where are you going? It's amazing, the chutzpah they had back then. But it wasn't chutzpah, it was uh, their desire to learn. He said, I'm going to do a favor to someone. Where are you, who, who, who are you doing a favor with? I'm going to eat. Who are you doing a favor to? To my body. I'm going to, I'm going, I, I, I'm going to the base markets. I'm going to the, to the bathhouse. <laughs> Why? Unfortunately, I needed to do my body needs. I'm doing it. But, and, 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 my, and, and to him, that was serious. To him, just like we go and do our neshama a favor and we daven, we do Hashem a favor and we daven. Uh, Adam, well, he was doing his good because him, his natural desire was to daven and learn to do mitzvahs. And for him to, uh, to, um, to entertain the body's needs was the opposite. The opposite. It's still his. Then was really his nefesh it's, it's, it's and the, and the, and the body. It's just that the nefesh took over. Correct, but the, yeah, and the desires and needs, of, the physical desires and needs have already become secondary to him. So therefore, if we understand this, if we understand that who are we? Who is our? What is our default status? Is we're klipa? What does klipa mean? Sure. Sh- yeah, but and what, we, we've been through this before. That I know. Klipa means something which obscures Hashem. I obscure Hashem. Why? Because if you wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning when my mind is half working and you ask me, what do you want? I'm not going to say I want to do a mitzvah. I'm not going to say I want to learn Torah. I mean... I don't know if I'd say 3 o'clock in the afternoon either, but it's definitely not 3 o'clock at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the tzaddik would be that way, because the tzaddik, that's their natural, that's not, their natural. So who, I obscure Hashem. In other words, by me, who is paramount? Is me. Not Hashem. In my natural way of looking at things, I'm concerned about myself. That's klipa. And klipa is a problem because how do I expect that the light of Hashem should catch on if the klipa is so strong? Vachin. What? Vachin. Vachin. We have to break the klipa. And who are we breaking? Ourselves. Ourselves. You know, in, in Yiddishkeit, gaiva is a big deal. Gemara says famously that Einani v'hu yechelim lader that Hashem says about Abal Gaiva that me and him we, we, can't coexist. Right? What does that mean? Mulei chalar is kvayd. Hashem is everywhere. Problem is that when you have a, when you're a Bal Gaiva, and when I say a Bal Gaiva, I want to be clear what I mean over here. Bal Gaiva is not someone who's a nasty, arrogant annoying person who everyone stays away from because the person smells. I don't mean physically, but uh, I'm talking about a self-absorbed person. The Abisha says, we can't live together. Why? Because your self-absorption isn't allowing me in. <coughs> There's no place for the both of us. I'm, I'm there, but you're not, you're not, uh, 
The klipa is too strong. The self-absorption is too strong. The stronger the nefesh Hamas is, it can't. The nefesh Hamas is about self. The nefesh is about Hashem. And if you, if the nefesh Hamas, the self-absorption of the nefesh Hamas is too strong, it's not going to catch on fire. You have to weaken the self-absorption. You have to weaken the self. That is what the mevachin is all about. There's a famous Chassidah Shavart. The Pasuk says, it's not, it's not Chabad Chassidah, I forget, it's one of the, uh, one of the other Rebbes. The Pasuk says, Ha'yisasar ish b'mistarim va'ani lo ar'anu nu'um Hashem. Which in Pashtatach means, can a person hide in a hiding place and I will not see him? Says Hashem. In other words, what do you, think? you think you hide from me? There's a Chassidah Shavart that says, if a person hides in a hiding place, va'ani, and a halts of Matthias, he thinks of ani, then lay it in Russian, then I don't see the person. But if a person hides in a person hides in a hiding place, va'ani loy, and there is no ani, he's not there, then aranu, then I see him. Then I see him. Well, yeah, uh, ultimately, and it's not, you know, it's one of those things that you know, we, our imagination of Hashem is that Hashem is sitting and watching. Okay, you do that, I'm going to react like this. You're going to do that, I'm going to react like that. that. Hashem, it's all cause and effect. You're a Balgaiva, you're self-absorbed. You're not allowing Hashem in. Why? Because self-absorption is the sum opposite of godliness. Godliness, Hashem is, is, is waiting to be invited in. And what's the way to be invited in? It's through bittel, it's through the lack of self-absorption. When you, you can't have two absorptions coming, in other words, it's two different things. So the point over here is, if you see that the light of the neshama is not, is not catching on, the light of the neshama, you're not getting excited, the problem is you're too excited about yourself. And that's why you can't get excited about Hashem. And if you're too excited about yourself, you have to break yourself. Could that lead to asmus? Sorry? If you destroy your self-image, then you might, and, and then that might lead to it could. Uh, a very, very depressive That's state. correct. And that is the seed. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, so and, is, and, and that is, is very and that is the seeds of redemption. If you look, at, but I just want to, if you turn to page, if you turn to page 78. 78? Oh. Yeah. Which is after two chapters of Mavachinle, Perik Lamedal, Tatrebe Stars. Even if you think deeply in all those things, one hour, two hours, you'll end up with a broken heart, and you'll become very depressed. Don't worry about it. And why? We're not going to get into the why not, but, but um, trust me that what the Altareb is going to say is that, in fact, this is going to lead you to greater happiness. Meaning, that, as explained in Chassidus many times, that if you want to take a seed and you want it to grow into a tree, the seed has to rot in the ground first. In other words, between one yesh and another yesh, there has to be ayin. Between one something and another something, there has to be nothing in the middle. The, in other words, the original something would, has, to, has to go away to give place to a new something. Yes, you have to be mevachinly break yourself. And why? To allow your neshama to shine with its simcha. The problem is that right now your guf is getting in the way. It's very important to know this, that the everywhere we're, go we're, the where we're going to be going to in the next two pair of chapters, and we're going to be crushed, like I said, to little pieces. But the goal isn't to crush. The goal is that from the, from the, from the crushed little pieces emerges a much more beautiful and happy self, which we're going to discover when we get into Perek Lamed Alf. Pieces of cash 